many of you remember the year 2004? Anybody? In 2004, in July, the Mars rover Spirit landed on Mars and had a problem with one of its front wheels. It was stuck. It wouldn't work. NASA needed to find a way to make, get the rover moving, otherwise the mission would be lost. After some, some hacking, some life hacking with things here on Earth, they realized at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory they could drive the rover backwards and just drag the broken front wheel as sort of an anchor. And what's ended up being amazing out of that is that mission was supposed to last 90 days. And because of their hacking and their amending, it was able to last more than five years. That is the ultimate life hack, I would think, on a planet far away. If you search life hacks on Google, you get more than six million results. We are obsessed with efficiency, and that's why this series is sort of focused around what does it mean to hack our lives, to live a better Christian life. But the truth is, there aren't a whole lot of Christian life hacks available to us. There's no way to, to change or shorten the time it takes for God to do the work in our hearts that God wants to do. God doesn't want us to cheat our way out of going through all the experiences he has for us. And as we studied through Proverbs, there was a verse in a translation of today's scripture that jumped out at me. And that word was diligence. Can y'all say diligence? Diligence. Diligence is something I think we all struggle with. This is what it says in Proverbs 4. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What does it mean to keep our heart with all diligence? Well, if you look up the word diligence in the dictionary, it means simply careful attention, <coughs> unceasing application, persistent endeavor. Biblically, this word diligence means to do something with care or with watchfulness and with persistence. It means that you and I become reliable. We become responsible. It is a very important idea scripturally. Now, one of the places that occurred to me that we experience diligence more than anywhere else is airport security. Y'all experience diligence at airport security? Several years ago, I was on a mission trip to Ethiopia. And on the way back, I had to fly back on my own because of a family emergency. And after the five-hour flight from Ethiopia to Dubai, I had a layover in Dubai. Around 2 o'clock in the morning local time, the time comes to board the flight to Washington. I'm dozing in a chair by the gate because I don't want to miss this flight. Now, when you fly from Dubai back to the United States, you've already gone through security one time in the airport. But then, if you're lucky, after you go through ticket, ticketing, you get to go on additional security if they so choose. There were 500 people getting on this plane. They pulled eight people for additional screening. Guess who one of those eight people was? It was me. It was 2.30 in the morning. I, all I wanted to do was get on the plane and go to sleep. And let me tell you, those folks in the Dubai airport, their security personnel, they were very diligent. Very diligent. The whole time the clock's running, I'm like, I, I got to get on this plane. I, I, and I'm starting to get disturbed. Now, if you get disturbed in airport security, you got to be careful how you get disturbed. You don't want to cause a ruckus. I don't speak the language these people speak. I'm trying to watch my manners. And it's challenging. And all of us at the gate, we're kind of looking around at each other. They're being held. And we're like, what's going on? Like, we don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. And finally, finally, 25 minutes later, they let us go. And we ran up the gangway and got on that plane. We almost missed the plane because we had been disturbed and we were distracted. We weren't paying attention. Now, let me tell you, after that, I felt very safe on that flight back to Washington. I knew they had been very diligent in their security. So even though I had gotten disturbed and distracted, that diligence may have saved our lives. I don't know. It may have saved our flight. So why do you and I need diligence? Well, it's not just safety. See, the thing is, in the Gospel of John, in John 10, Jesus says this. He says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. 
My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Friends, there is an evil presence in our world. There is a thief who seeks to kill and destroy. But the way the enemy works more often than not is not in violence, it is in distraction, drawing our attention away from where we need to be focused, distracting us from our main purpose because we aren't staying diligent. We experience delays in our spiritual growth. We end up going through disturbances, and ultimately, if we're not careful, we might end up facing destruction because there is an evil one who is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. We need spiritual diligence. We need diligence for ourselves, for our families, for our church. We live in a world that is bombarded with culturally relative truths. But there is only one true truth, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be diligent and pay attention to that and guard our hearts. We need to look at God's word and see the direction God is calling us to go. But we can be diligent about all these other things in life. But if we're not diligent about spiritual things, we will lose our way. And we can get totally lost and miss the plane. 1 Peter 5 it says this, discipline yourselves, be vigilant. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Diligence is seeking God's perspective and God's priorities. But the opposite of diligence in Proverbs is this really fun word. This fun word, sluggard. Can y'all say sluggard? It means carelessness, neglect, laziness. Proverbs 13 says this, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. The good news is that Jesus Christ has the power to transform you and I from sluggards into self-starters, transform parasites into producers, the greedy into generous people. And I love the quote that somebody says about this word sluggard. He said, God's way to cure a sluggard is to make them a saint. But how do we become saints? By diligently following the will of God. We don't become a saint just like that. We become a saint through diligence, through seeking the heart of God. Someone once said that the river cuts through a rock not because of its power, but because of its persistence. Persistence in many of our failures in life come because we don't realize how close we are to success and we give up too soon. Jesus never gave up. Jesus went all the way to the cross for you and for me. God never will give up on you, and God never gives up on me. That's one of the the definitions of persistence, don't give up. Many of us know the meaning of diligence when it comes to our work or our jobs. We're diligent about that. We're diligent about our schooling and our children's schooling. We're diligent about the things that we think are important in life, what we're passionate about. But remember that Jesus also said this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Be diligent about the things of God, and all these things will be added to you. Be diligent about the things of God more than we are diligent about the things of this earth, and all the things will be added to you. Three of the most important things that we need to be diligent about in our lives are this. We need to be diligent in our worship, diligent in our walk, and diligent in our witness. Friends, I believe if we do those things, if we're diligent in our worship, our walk, and our witness, then the rest of our lives will find purpose and abundant life. See, worship begins our walk. You and I can't have a walk with God unless we know how to worship God. And we begin to know who God is through that worship. Psalm 89 says this, Your love, God, is my song. And I will sing it. I'm forever telling everyone how faithful you are. I'll never quit telling the story of your love. How you built the cosmos and guaranteed everything in it. Friends, we need to worship God for who God is. And the thing is this, our worship does not change God. Our worship changes us. When we are diligent about our worship, we turn our eyes away from the disappointments of life. We take our eyes off the distractions We don't see the disturbances in life as much because we are focused on God, on the God who created everything and holds everything in his hands. 
One of the things that distracts so many of us from worshiping God is that we worship what we have. And when we worship what we have, we get focused on what we don't have. So often we want a transaction with God and not a transformation from God. We want something from God, but we don't want God to transform us. Paul said it this way in Romans 1, all of this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshiped the God they made instead of the God who made them. The God we bless, the God who blesses us. See, everything begins with diligent worship. That begins the transformation in our hearts. Paul, in writing his letter to the Corinthians, talks about transformation. He says, but when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we are transformed into his image when we worship God. Remember the story when Jesus died on the cross? What happened in the temple? The veil was torn in two. We no longer needed somebody to intercede on our behalf. We had access to God Almighty. We, our repentant hearts could be transformed because we could be in the presence of the Almighty God, and it starts with worship. This morning I asked, do you need change? Do you need some kind of a breakthrough? If so, I challenge you to simply bow and worship the God of breakthroughs. If you need peace, worship the God of peace. If you need wisdom, worship the source of all wisdom. And do it with persistence and diligence. Not just on Sunday, but all the time. Now, when you think about life hacks, this phone can be a very pain for us, a big pain for us. The tip of our fingers is a blessing. You can access any worship video or song you want in the world like that. There's people watching us online this morning because they're out of town and they have their phone with them. That's great. But we can also get distracted very easily by this. I encourage folks on your home screen, put a link to a worship song. Put a link to a YouTube playlist of worship songs. Why? Because every day we need to spend time in that worship. We get our heart filled, not just on Sunday morning. And I will say this, I think when we worship, when we return to our regular worship schedule in a few weeks, we can increase our worship. We don't need to be bashful in how we worship. We invite God, the Holy Spirit, to be present and among us when we worship. Don't be ashamed of worshiping God. Don't be afraid that God's Spirit might move in a mighty way. People will come and people will watch and they will feel the presence of God, the presence of God moving. And the other thing I encourage you about music is this. When folks, sometimes when folks text me or call me or email me and they want some help, they're having a struggle. One of the first things I do is I point them to worship songs. Because I know that if they'll listen to that worship song, they'll listen to the message God has in a song. They'll start to worship and their heart will start to be changed. There are great songs out there. You need to be diligent in finding them and not just finding them but worshiping with them. In addition to being diligent in our worship, we need to be diligent in our walk with God. You see, our worship inspires our walk, inspires our journey. And that worship will change our walk. One of the main ways that you and I can be diligent about our walk with God is in our prayer lives. I want people to say, why is God doing what God is doing at Buckhall Church? Why is God doing that? And the answer is simply be because they are diligent about their prayer. A church that is committed to being diligent about prayer every day. I pray every week. I pray every Friday and every Sunday for every one of you who come to this service and who watch online. And the more people we have being diligent in prayer life, God will bless that diligence. I don't know about you, but one of the things I get in my email every day is multiple daily devotionals. People have signed me up for daily devotionals because they like their pastor getting devotionals, I guess. But every morning I get these great devotionals and I love them, I read them, and I spend time in them. One of the things that's really cool is so often when I spend time in those devotionals, in the next 24 hours, somebody will come to me with something that applies to one of those devotionals. And I can simply send them the devotional that I just read and share with them the gospel and share with them in their walk what they can do. And then 
How many of you guys have airplane mode on your phone, right? You turn airplane mode on your phone? Not just for flying. One of the greatest distractions we have in spending time and diligent time in our walk with God is we get into it and our phone goes ding. We get an email, we get a text, we get a notification. Turn the do not disturb on. Set it for 20 minutes. Set it for 30 minutes. And be diligent in your time with God. The world can wait, I promise. And then a final tip for you relating to your phones and diligence this morning. Get scripture wallpaper. Get a scripture wallpaper. You can do it in the YouVersion Bible app. There's apps that will do it for you. Get that scripture on your phone screen. Research says that the majority of people look at this phone 80 times a day. 80 times a day. Some people as many as four times uh, every four minutes, excuse me. Every four minutes. At least if you're going to do that, let's look at scripture while we do it. Now that's challenging for me because I have my wife and kids on my phone. So I need to alternate. Seek first the kingdom of God and my family. And just alternate it on a regular basis, I guess. But the more we have scripture in front of us, the more we will internalize that scripture. The more we will learn that scripture by heart. One of my great theme verses that I love in life is Hebrews 11. How many of you have all seen this before? And without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's a great verse. So all my, a lot of my decisions as a pastor, as a parent, as a spouse, are based on that verse. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But as I was doing this study, I dug a little deeper and I reminded myself that there is more to that verse than just that line. The verse goes on to say this. For he who comes to God must believe that he exists and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We've got to keep seeking the Lord, friends. I want to be a man of God and keep seeking the Lord and trusting in faith. And diligent worship will inspire a diligent walk. But a diligent walk is not where it ends because God also wants us to be diligent in our witness. If we just do the first two, we may have a strong faith, but we won't ever share it with anybody. I love what 1 Timothy says. Be sure to use the abilities God has given you through his prophets when the elders of the church lay their hands upon your head. Put these abilities to work. Throw yourself into your task so that everyone may notice your improvement and progress. Keep a close watch on all you do and think. There's the diligence. Stay true to what is right. And God will bless you and use you to help others. Be diligent in our worship, our walk, and in our witness. Now, I know many people, you may say online or in this room, say, hey, there's somebody, pastor, there's somebody I've been trying to reach. I've been trying to do it for weeks or months. Neighbor, a coworker, a family member. I would tell you, don't give up. Be diligent. Be persistent. Thomas Edison said, the greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is to try one more time. Let's try one more time to share our faith. And we need to be a witness to those who know Christ, but we also need to be a witness to those who have never heard the good news. I've been always reminded by my friends at Empowering Action, a mission group in Dominican Republic and in Haiti, that Jesus calls us to go to the poor. One of the pastors I know from the DR, his name is Estrus. He always says, you know, the, part of the role of empowering action is to restore dignity to the people in my village. Friends, there will always be opportunities for you and I to witness and to restore dignity to those who don't have what we are blessed with. To help them experience the love of God. To begin a new start. To reach a fresh start. To reach a hand over to help and not a hand down in condescension. We need to share the faith and be diligent in that. If you're not in the midst of that and you've never done that and you're just kind of worried about that, I understand that. I'll give you a very simple additional life hack for how to be a good witness. What was your life like before Jesus? How did you meet Jesus? And what has your life been like since Jesus? Those three questions. You can answer those questions. You can tell anybody about Jesus Christ. Because you simply tell your own story. Maybe you come this morning distracted, discouraged. Maybe you've grown disillusioned with God. 
But friends, I tell you this, God brought you here online in this room today. Maybe you're busy, maybe you're burned out, you're bruised, you're broken. You're in good company. Because Jesus knew what it was like to be busy, burned out. Jesus said often, I got to leave the crowds. I have to leave the needs of the people and I need to go spend time with my father. I need to worship at the feet of my father and receive some spiritual nourishment so I can get up and go again. We have a God who's incredibly diligent. You may feel like giving up on God, but friends, I tell you this, God has never and will never give up on you. Francis Thompson in the late 1800s was battling an opiate addiction and he wrote a poem, maybe one of the greatest spiritual poems ever written, The Great Hound of Heaven. A poem about God's relentlessness, God's diligent pursuit of all those he loves through everything. Friends, the cross made a way for us. I almost missed a flight in Ethiopia because of a very diligent security team. And I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody to miss the most important journey you'll take because you get distracted or disturbed. I want you to be diligent after the things of God. Be diligent. We're going to close this morning with a song that God has blessed my life with. I listen to it all the time. It's a song called So Will I. Because everything starts with worship. That's where we discover who God is. And if we don't spend time with God, we'll never be effective for God. The song says, if creation declares the worth of God, so will I. If creation obeys God, so will I. If the stars were made to worship, then so will I. If everything exists to lift you high, so will I. And I want you to leave those here this morning with those three words in your head. So will I. I will be diligent. I will be diligent in my worship, in my walk, and in my witness. Let us pray. Father God, as we Spend the rest of our time in worship. I invite your Holy Spirit to move among us. And in this song, God, there's a word. There's a line you're going to use to speak to somebody. To encourage them, convict, convince, to transform them. God, we invite your Holy Spirit to move among us. Let's stay and be diligent in our worship. Amen. Amen.